Hello again. Uh, well, today I'm going to read chapter four and perhaps chapter five of A Diplomat in Japan. We'll see how we go. So let me share the screen. Uh, here we are. Okay, chapter four. Treaties, anti-foreign spirit, murder of foreigners. The expedition of Commodore Perry to Luchu, that's Okinawa or Ryukyu in fact, which is Okinawa, and Japan was not the first enterprise of its kind that had been undertaken by the Americans. Having accomplished their own independence as the result of a contest in which a few millions of half-united colonists had successfully withstood the well-trained legions of Great Britain and her German mercenaries, though not, it may be fairly said, without in a great measure owing their success to the very efficient assistance of French armies and fleets, they added to this memory of ancient wrongs a natural fellow feeling for other nations who were less able to resist the might of the greatest commercial and maritime power the world has yet seen. While sympathizing with Eastern peoples in the defense of their independent rights, they believed that a conciliatory mode of treating them was at least equally well fitted to ensure the concession of those trading privileges to which the Americans are not less indifferent than the English. In 1836, sorry, in 1836, they had dispatched an envoy to Siam and Cochin, China, who was successful in negotiating by peaceful methods a treaty of commerce with the former state. In China, like the other Western states, they had profited by the negotiations, which were the outcome of the Opium War, without having to incur the odium of using force or the humiliation of finding their softer methods prove a failure in dealing with the obstinate conservatism of Chinese mandarins. For many years, their eyes had been bent upon Japan, which lay on the opposite side of the Pacific, fronting their own state of California, then rising into fame as one of the great gold producing regions of the globe. Warned by the fate of all previous attempts to break down the wall of seclusion that hemmed in the country of the gods, they resolved to make such a show of force that with reasonable people unfamiliar with modern artillery, might prove as powerful an argument as theories of universal brotherhood and the obligations imposed by the Committee of Nations. They appointed to the chief command a naval officer possessed of both tact and determination, whose judicious use of the former qualification rendered the employ of the second unnecessary. Probably no one was more agreeably surprised than Commodore Perry at the comparative ease with which, on his second visit to the Bay of Yedo, he obtained a treaty satisfactory enough as a beginning. No doubt the counsels of the Dutch agent at Nagasaki were not without their effect, and we may also conjecture that the desire which had already begun to manifest itself among some of the lower samurai for a wider acquaintance with the mysterious outer world was secretly shared by men in high positions. Fear alone would not have induced a haughty government like that of the shoguns to acquiesce in breaking through a law of restriction that had such a highly creditable antiquity to boast of. Most men's motives are mixed and there was on the Japanese side no very decided unwillingness to yield to a show of force, which the pretext of prudence would enable them to justify. England and Russia, then or shortly afterwards at war, followed in the wake of the United States. Next, an American consul general took up his residence at Shimoda to look after the interests of whaling vessels and skillfully made use of the recent events in China to induce the shogun's government to extend, sorry, shortly afterwards at war, that would be the Crimea, wouldn't it? Uh, Shogun's government to extend concessions already granted. In 1858, the China War, having been apparently brought to a successful conclusion, Lord Elgin and the French ambassador, Baron Gros, uh, ran across to Japan and concluded treaties on the same basis as Mr. Harris, Townsend Harris. And before long, similar privileges were accorded to Holland and Russia. In 1859, the ports of Nagasaki, Hakodate, and Yokohama were thrown open to the trade of the five powers and a new age was inaugurated in Japan. It was not without opposition that the Shogun's government had entered into its first engagements with the United States, Great Britain and Russia. An agitation arose when the first American ships anchored in the Bay of Yedo and there were not wanting bold and rash men ready to undertake any desperate enterprise against the foreign invaders of the sacred soil of Japan. But at this time, there was no leader to whom the malcontents could turn for guidance. The Mikado was closely watched by the shogun's resident at Kyoto, and the daimyos were divided among themselves. 
The principal opponent was the ex-prince of Mito, whose constitutional duty was to support the shogun and aid him with his counsels in all great national crises. During the presence of Commodore Perry, the reigning shogun Ieyoshi had fallen ill and he died not long after the squadron had sailed. He was succeeded by his son Iesada, a man of 28 who does not seem to have been endowed with either force of character or knowledge of the world. Such qualities are not to be expected from the kind of education which fell to the lot of Japanese princes in those days. In view of the expected return of the American ships in the following year, forts were constructed to guard the seafront of the capital and the ex-prince of Mito was summoned from his retirement to take the lead in preparing to resist the encroachments of foreign powers. By a curious coincidence, this nobleman, then 49 years of age, was the representative of a family which for years had maintained the theoretical right of the Mikado to exercise the supreme government and was at the same time strongly opposed to any extension of the limited intercourse with foreign countries then permitted. Nor can it be wondered that Japan, who had so successfully protected herself from foreign aggression by a policy of rigid exclusion, and which had seen the humiliation of China consequent upon disputes with the Western power arising out of trade questions at the very moment when she was being torn by a civil war, which owed its origin to the introduction of new religious beliefs from the West, should have believed that the best means of maintaining peace at home and avoiding an unequal contest with Europe was to adhere strictly to the traditions of the past two centuries. But when the intrusive foreigners returned in the beginning of the following year, Japan found herself still unprepared to repel them by force. The treaty was therefore signed, interdicting trade, but permitting whalers to obtain supplies in the three harbors of Nagasaki, Hakodate, and Shimoda, and promising friendly treatment to shipwrecked sailors. While making these unavoidable concessions, the Japanese buoyed themselves up with the belief that their innate superiority could enable them easily to overcome the better equipped forces of foreign countries when once they had acquired the modern arts of warfare and provided themselves with a sufficient proportion of the ships and weapons of the 19th century. From that time onwards, this was the central idea of Japan's foreign policy for many years, as the sequel will show. Even at this period, there were a few who would have willingly started off on this new quest and two Japanese actually asked Commodore Perry to give them a passage in his flagship. They were refused, and their zeal was punished by their own government with imprisonment. The residence of Mr. Harris at Shimoda and the visit which he insisted on paying to the capital created fresh difficulties for the advisors of the shogun. Written protests were delivered by non-official members of his council, and he was obliged at last to ask the Mikado's sanction to the treaties in order to strengthen his own position. This invocation of the Mikado's authority may fairly be called an innovation upon ancient custom. Neither Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, nor Ieyasu had thought it necessary to get their acts approved by him, and Ieyasu granted trade privileges entirely on his own responsibility, without his right to do so ever being questioned. This reference to Kyoto is the first sign of the decadence of the shogun's power. Supremacy of the Mikado having been once admitted, his right to a voice in the affairs of the country could no longer be disputed. His nobles seized the opportunity and assumed the attitude of, of obstruction, which has always been a powerful weapon in the hands of individuals and parties. One man out of a dozen of sufficient determination can always force the others to yield when his position is legal and cannot be disturbed by the use of force. On the other hand, Mr. Harris pressed for a revision of the treaty and the concession of open ports at Kanagawa and Osaka, on the other was the court, uh, turning an obstinately deaf ear to all proposals. In its desperation, the shogun's government, appointed to be prime minister or regent, as he was called by foreigners, the descendant of Ieyasu's most trusted retainer, the daimyo I Kamon no Kami of Hikone. That's other, he was otherwise known as I Nasuke. And Mr. Harris, as has already been said, skillfully turned to account, turning to account the recent exploits of the combined English and French squadrons in the Chinese seas, obtained his treaty, achieving a diplomatic triumph of the greatest value purely by the use of moral pressure. The English, French, Russian and Dutch treaties followed. The shogun stood committed to a policy from which his new allies were not likely to allow of his receding, while to the anti-foreign party was imparted a consistency that there had previously been little chance of its acquiring. Yes, Harris used um, the power or the threat of force from Britain, especially, and France, uh, to get his treaty signed. 
Scarcely was the ink of these engagements dry when the shogun, who had been indisposed for some weeks past, was gathered to his fathers, leaving no heir. According to the custom which had been observed on two previous occasions, when there had been a break in the direct line, a prince was chosen from the house of Kishu to be his successor. The ex-prince of Mito and several of his sympathizers among the leading nobles, namely Hizen, Owari, Tosa, Satsuma, and the Date of Uajima, a man of abilities superior to the size of his tiny fief in Shikoku, had desired to choose a younger son of Mito, who had been adopted into the family of Hitotsubashi. But the prime minister was too strong for them. He insisted on the election of his own nominee and forced his opponents to retire into private life. Thus, to their disapproval of the political course adopted by the shogunate was added a personal resentment against its chief minister, and this feeling was shared in a remarkable degree by the retainers of the disgraced nobles. A bloody revenge was taken two years later on the individual, but the hostility to the system only increased with time and in the end brought about its complete ruin. Mito was the ringleader of the opposition and began actively to intrigue with the Mikado's party against the head of his own family. The foreigners arrived in numbers at Kanagawa and Yokohama and affronted the feelings of the haughty samurai by their independent demeanor, so different from the cringing subservience to which the rules of Japanese etiquette condemned the native merchant. It was not long before blood was shed. On the evening of the 26th August, six weeks after the establishment at Yedo of the British and American representatives, an officer and a seaman belonging to a Russian man of war were cut to pieces in the streets of Yokohama, where they had landed to buy provisions. In November, a Chinese servant belonging to the French vice consul was attacked and killed in the foreign settlement at Yokohama. Two months later, Sir R. Alcox, Sir Rutherford Alcox, native linguist of the British legation was stabbed from behind as he was standing at the gateway of the British legation in Yedo, and within a month more, two Dutch merchant captains were slaughtered in the high street at Yokohama. Then there was a lull for eight or nine months till the French minister's servant was cut at and badly wounded as he was standing at the gate of the legation in Yedo. On the 14th January 1861, Huskin, the secretary of the American mission, was attacked and murdered as he was riding home after a dinner party at the Prussian legation. And on the night of July the 5th occurred the boldest attempt yet made on the life of foreigners when the British legation was attacked by a band of armed men and a stoutly defended by the native guard. This was a considerable catalogue for a period of no more than two years since the opening of the ports to commerce. In every case, the attack was premeditated and unprovoked. And the perpetrators on every occasion belonged to the sword bearing class. No offence had been given by the victims to those who had thus ruthlessly cut them down they were assassinated from motives of a political character, and the murderers went unpunished in every instance. Japan came to be, became to be known as a country where the foreigner carried his life in his hand, and the dread of incurring the fate of which so many examples had already occurred became general among the residents. Even in England, before I left to take up my appointment, we felt that apart from the chances of climate, the risk of coming to an untimely end at the hands of an expert swordsman must be taken into account. Consequently, I bought a revolver with a due supply of powder, bullets, and caps. The trade to Japan in these weapons must have been very great in those days, as everyone wore a pistol whenever he ventured beyond the limits of the foreign settlement and constantly slept with one under his pillow. It was a busy time for Colt and Adams. But in all the years of my experience in Japan, I never heard of more than one life being taken by a revolver, and that was when a Frenchman shot a carpenter who demanded payment for his labor in a somewhat too demonstrative manner. In Yedo, I think we finally gave up wearing revolvers in 1869, chiefly because the few of us who resided there had come to the conclusion that the weight of the weapon was inconvenient, and also that if any bloodthirsty two-sworded gentleman intended to, to take our lives, he would choose his time and opportunity so as to leave us no chance of anticipating his purpose with a bullet. In the spring of 1862, Sir Rutherford Alcock returned to England on leave of absence and Colonel Neal was left in charge. As I have said before, disbelieving in the validity of the reasons which had led the minister to remove his official residence to Yokohama, the chargé d'affaires re-established himself at the temple formerly occupied as the British legation. On the anniversary, according to the Japanese calendar of the attack referred to on a previous page, 
Some commissioners for foreign affairs in calling upon Colonel Neal congratulated him and themselves on the fact that a whole year had elapsed since any French attempt had been made on the life of a foreigner. It was not unnatural, therefore, that in the first impulse of indignation at the savage and bloody slaughter of the sentry and corporal almost at his bedroom door, he should have conceived the suspicion that the visit of the commissioners and their language in the morning had been intended to put him off his guard, and that consequently the Japanese government, or rather the shogun's ministers, were implicated in what looked like a barbarous act of treachery that deprived the Japanese nation of all right to be regarded as a civilized community. More especially as the native watch had been recently changed and fresh men substituted for those who had fought so well in the defense of Sir Rutherford Alcock the year before. But on reflection, it will be easily be seen that there was no real justification for such a belief. The assassin was one of the guard. After the murder of the two Englishmen, he returned to his quarters and there committed suicide by ripping himself up in the approved Japanese fashion. We may be sure that if his act had been the result of a conspiracy, he would not have been alone. Ignorant as the shogun's ministers may have been, and probably were, of the sacred character of an envoy, it was not their interest to bring upon themselves the armed vengeance of foreign powers at a moment when they were confronted with the active enmity of the principal clans of the West. I think they may be entirely absolved from all share in this attempt to massacre the inmates of the English legation. But on the other hand, it seems highly probable that the man's comrades were aware of his intention and that after his partial success, they connived at his escape. But he had been wounded by a bullet discharged from the pistol of the second man whom he attacked, and drops of blood on the ground showed the route by which he had made his way out of the garden. As his identity could not be concealed, he had to commit suicide in order to anticipate the penalty of death, which the shogun's government could not have avoided inflicting on him. The apparent cognizance of the other men on guard who were what our law would call accessories before the fact, and the fact that nevertheless they took no share in his act is consonant with the statement that he was merely accomplishing an act of private revenge. His selection of the darkness of night seems to indicate that he hoped to escape the consequences. Willis said that when he arose and looked out, the night was pitch dark. It was the night before full moon and in the very middle of what is called in Japan the rainy season. He informed me that there was a high wind and that heavy black clouds were drifting over the sky. The stormy weather and the lateness of the hour, 11 to 12 o'clock, might perhaps account for the native lanterns which were hung about the grounds having ceased to give any light. But even under those circumstances, it is a little suspicious that the guard should have neglected to replace the burnt out candles. It was at Taku on our way down from Peking that Robertson, Jameson and I heard of this new attack on the legation. I believe our feeling was rather one of regret that we had lost the opportunity of experiencing one of the stirring events which we had already learned to regard as normally characteristic of life in Japan. It certainly did not take us by surprise and in no way rendered the service less attractive. But Jameson had found a better opening in Shanghai and the remaining two went on to Yokohama as soon as they could get a passage. The remaining two being uh, Sato and Robertson and that is the end of chapter four. Chapter five, Richardson's murder, Japanese studies. The day after my arrival at Yokohama, I was taken over to Kanagawa and introduced to the Reverend S.R. Brown, an American missionary who was then engaged in printing a work on colloquial Japanese and to Dr. J.C. Hebern, MD, that's H-E-P-B-U-R-N, MD, medical doctor, who was employed on a dictionary of the language. The former died some years ago, but the latter is at this moment, 1886, still in Japan, bringing out the third edition of his invaluable lexicon and completing the translation of the Bible on which he has been occupied for many years. There is a footnote there, uh, number two, uh, what does that say? Dr. Hebern died in 1911. In those days, we had either to take a native sculling boat for an Ichibu across the bay to Kanagawa or ride round by the causeway, the land along which the railway now runs not having been filled in at that time. Natives used to cross by a public ferry boat paying a tempo, 16 and a half to the Ichibu a piece, but no foreigner was ever allowed to make use of the cheaper conveyance. If he was quick enough to catch the ferry boat before it had pushed off, 
and so sees a place for himself, the boatman simply refused to stir. They remained immovable until the intruder was tired of waiting and abandoned the game. It was only after a residence of some years when I had become pretty fluent in the language and could argue the point with the certainty of having the public on my side, that I at last succeeded in overcoming the obstinacy of the people at the boathouse who had the monopoly of carrying foreigners. There was in those days a fixed price for the foreigner wherever he went, arbitrarily determined without reference to the native tariff. At the theater, a foreigner had to pay an ichibu for admittance and was then thrust into the deaf box, as the gallery seats are called, which are so far from the stage that the actor's speeches are quite indistinguishable. The best place for both seeing and hearing is the doma on the area of the theater close in front of the stage. On one occasion, I walked into the theater and took my place in one of the divisions of the doma, offering to pay the regular price. No, they would not take it. I must pay my ichibu and go to the foreigner's box. I held out, insisting on my right as one of the public. Did I not squat on the floor with my boots off, just like themselves? Well then, if I would not come out of that, the curtain would not rise. I rejoined that they might please themselves about that. In order to annoy a single foreigner, they would deprive the rest of the spectators of the pleasure they had paid to enjoy. So I obstinately kept my place, and in the end, the manager gave way. The house, in inverted commas, was amused at the foreigner speaking their language and getting the best of the argument. And for the rest of my time in Yokohama, I had no more difficulty in obtaining accommodation in any part of the theater that I preferred. In those days, the Yokohama theater used to begin about 11 o'clock in the morning and keep open for 12 hours. A favorite play was the Chushin Gura, or Treasury of Faithful Retainers, and the Sara Yashiki, or the Broken Plate Mansion. The arrangement of the interior, the fashion of dress and acting, the primitive character of the scenery and lights, the literary style of the plays have not undergone any changes and are very unlikely to be modified in any marked degree by contact with European ideas. There is some talk now and then of elevating the character of the stage and making the theatre a school of morals and manners for the young, but the good people who advocate these theories in the press have not, as far as I know, ventured to put them to practical proof, and the Shibai will, I hope, always continue to be what it always has been in Japan, a place of amusement and distraction, where people of all ages and sizes go to enjoy themselves without caring one atom whether the incidents are improbable or proper, so long as there is enough of the tragic to call forth the tears which every natural man sheds with satisfaction on proper occasions, and of the comic by turns to give the facial muscles a stretch in the other direction. On the 14th of September, a most barbarous murder was committed on a Shanghai merchant named Richardson. He, in company with a Mrs. Borodale of Hong Kong and Woodthorpe C. Clark and William Marshall, both of Yokohama, were riding along the high road between Kanagawa and Kawasaki when they met with a train of daimyo's retainers who bid them stand aside. They passed on at the edge of the road until they came in sight of a palanquin occupied by Shimazu Saburo, father of the Prince of Satsuma. They were now ordered to turn back and as they were wheeling their horses in obedience, were suddenly set upon by several armed men belonging to the train who hacked at them with their sharp edged heavy swords. Richardson fell from his horse in a dying state and the two other men were so severely wounded that they called out to the lady, ride on, we can do nothing for you. She got safely back to Yokohama and gave the alarm. Everybody in the settlement who possessed a pony and a revolver at once armed himself and galloped off towards the scene of the slaughter. Of slaughter, sorry. Lieutenant Colonel Vise, V-Y-S-E, the British consul, led off the legation mounted escort in spite of Colonel Neal's order that they should not move until he or their own commander gave the word. Monsieur de Belcourt, the French minister, sent out his escort, consisting of a half dozen French troopers. Lieutenant Price of the 67th Regiment marched off part of the legation guard, accompanied by some French infantry. But amongst the first, perhaps the very first of all, was Dr. Willis, whose high sense of the duty cast on him by his profession Rendered, rendered him absolutely fearless. Passing for a mile along the ranks of the men whose swords were reeking with the blood of Englishmen, he rode along the high road through Kanagawa, where he was joined by some three or four more Englishmen. He proceeded onwards to Namamugi, where poor Richardson's corpse was found under the shade of a tree by the roadside. 
His throat had been cut as he was lying there, wounded and helpless. The body was covered with sword cuts, and any, any one of which was sufficient to cause death. It was carried thence to the American consulate in Kanagawa, where Clark and Marshall had found refuge and surgical aid at the hands of Dr. Hebern, and later on of Dr. Jenkins, our other doctor. There was only one British man of war lying in the harbor, but in the course of the evening, Admiral Cooper arrived in his flagship, the Uriah Uriah the Uriah with the gun vessel Ringdove. The excitement among the foreign merchant mercantile community was intense, for this was the first occasion on which one of their own number had been struck down. The Japanese sword is as sharp as a razor and inflicts fearful gashes. The Japanese had a way of cutting a man to pieces rather than leave any life in him. This had a most powerful effect on the minds of Europeans who came to look on every two-sworded man as a probable assassin. And if they met one in the street, thank God as soon as they had passed him and found themselves in safety. It was known that Shimazu Saburo was to lie that night at Hodogaya, a post town scarcely two miles from Yokohama. To surround and seize him with the united forces of all the foreign vessels in port would, in their opinion, have been both easy and justifiable, and viewed by the light of our later knowledge, not only of Japanese politics, but also of Japanese ideas with regard to the right of taking redress, they were not far wrong. In the absence of any organized police or military force able to keep order among the turbulent two sordid classes, it cannot be doubted that this course would have been adopted by any Japanese clan against whom such an offense had been committed, and the foreign nationalities in Japan were in the same position as a native clan. They were subject to the authorities of their own country, who had jurisdiction over them both in criminal and civil matters, and were responsible for keeping them within the bounds of law and for their protection against attack. A meeting was called at Hooper's, W.C. Clark's partner, House, under the presidency of Colonel F. Howard Vise, the British consul, when after an earnest discussion and the rejection of a motion to request the foreign naval authorities to land 1,000 men in order to arrest the guilty parties, a deputation consisting of some of the leading residents was appointed to wait on the commanding officers of the Dutch, French, and, naval, and English naval forces and lay before them the conclusions of the meeting. The British Admiral, however, declined to act upon their suggestion, but consented to attend another meeting, which was to be held at the re residence of the French minister at 6 a.m. on the following morning. The deputation then went to Colonel Neal, who with great magnanimity waived all personal considerations and promised to be present also. The idea had got abroad amongst the foreign community that Colonel Neal could not be trusted to take the energetic measures which they considered necessary under the circumstances. In fact, they found fault with him for preserving the cool bearing which might be expected from a man who had seen actual service in the field and which especially became a man in his responsible situation. And they thought that pressure could be brought upon him through his colleagues and the general opinion of the other foreign representatives. But in this expectation, they were disappointed. At the meeting, Colonel Neal altogether declined to authorize the adoption of measures which, if the tycoon's government were to be regarded as the government of the country, would have amounted virtually to making war upon Japan, and the French minister expressed an opinion entirely coinciding with that of his colleague. Karma councils prevailed, and diplomacy was left to its own resources, arrangements, however, being made by the naval commanders-in-chief to patrol the settlements during the night and to station guard boats along the seafront to communicate with, uh, with the ships in case of an alarm. Looking back now after the lapse of nearly a quarter of a century, I am strongly disposed to the belief that Colonel Neal took the best course. The plan of the mercantile community was bold, attractive, and almost romantic. It would probably have been successful for the moment in spite of the well-known bravery of the Satsuma Samurai. But such an event as the capture of a leading Japanese nobleman by foreign sailors in the dominions of the tycoon would have been a patent demonstration of his incapacity to defend the nation against the outer barbarian and would have precipitated his downfall long before it actually took place and before there was anything in the shape of a league among the clans ready to establish a new government. In all probability, the country would have become a prey to ruinous anarchy and collisions with, the for with foreign powers would have been frequent and serious. Probably the slaughter of the foreign community at Nagasaki would have been the immediate answer to the blow struck at Hodogaya. A joint expedition would have been sent out to out by England, France and Holland, 
to fight many a bloody battle and perhaps dismember the realm of the Mikados. In the meantime, the commerce for whose sake we had come to Japan would have been killed, and how many lives of Europeans and Japanese would have been sacrificed in return for that of Shimazu Saburo? I was standing outside the hotel that afternoon, and on seeing the bustle of men riding past, inquired what was the cause. The reply, a couple of Englishmen have been cut down in Kanagawa, did not shock me in the least. The accounts of such occurrences that had appeared in the English press and the recent attack on the legation, of which I had heard on my way from Peking, had prepared me to look on the murder of a foreigner as, a, as an ordinary everyday affair. And the horror of bleeding wounds was not sufficiently familiar to me to excite the feelings of indignation that seemed to animate everyone else. I was secretly ashamed of my want of sympathy. And yet, if it had been otherwise, such a sudden introduction to the danger of a horrid death might have rendered me quite unfit for the career I had adopted. This habit of looking upon assassination as part of the day's work enabled, enabled me later by a moral anesthetic, uh, 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 sorry, enabled me later on to face with equanimity what most men whose sensations had not been deadened by a moral anesthetic would perhaps have considered serious dangers. And while everyone in my immediate surroundings was in a state of excitement, defending Vise or abusing Colonel Neal, I quietly settled down to my studies. In those days, the helps to the acquisition of the Japanese language were very few. A thin pamphlet by the Reverend J. Liggins, containing a few phrases in the Nagasaki dialect, a vocabulary compiled by William Medhurst Sr. and published at Batavia many years before, Rodriguez's Japanese grammar by Landres, a grammar by M. M. Yudonka Curtius and Hoffman in Dutch, and the French translation of it by Leon Pages, a translation by the latter of part of the Japanese Portuguese Dictionary of 1603, Hoffman's Dialogues in Japanese, Dutch and English, Rosny's Introduction, Introduction à la langue japonaise, were about all. And but few of these were procurable in Japan. I had left London without any books on the language. Luckily for me, Dr. S. R. Brown was the, just then printing his colloquial Japanese, and generously allowed me to have the first few sheets as they came over at intervals from the printing office in Shanghai. A Japanese reprint of Medhurst's vocabulary, which could be bought in a Japanese bookshop that stood at the corner of Bentendori and Honcho Ichome, speedily proved useless. But I had a slight acquaintance with the Chinese written characters and was the fortunate possessor of Medhurst's Chinese English dictionary, by whose help I could managed to come at the meaning of a Japanese word if I got it written down. It was very uphill work at first for I had no teacher and living in a single room at the hotel abutting two on the bowling alley could not secure quiet. The Colonel ordered us, Robertson and myself, to attend every day at the office, we did not call it the chancery then, to ask if our services were required and what work we had consisted, we had consisted chiefly of copying dispatches and interminable accounts. My handwriting was, unfortunately for me, considered to be rather better than average, and I began to foresee that a larger share of clerical work would be given to me than I liked. My theory of the duty of a student interpreter was then, and still is, to learn the language first of all. I considered that this order would be a great interruption to serious work if he insisted upon it, and would take away all chances of our learning the language thoroughly. At last I summoned up courage to protest, and I rather think my friend Willis encouraged me to do this but I did not gain anything by remonstrating. The Colonel evidently thought I was frightfully lazy, for when I said that the office work would interfere with my studies, he replied that it would be much worse for both to be neglected than for one to be hindered. At first, there was some idea of renting a house for Robertson and myself, but finally the Colonel decided to give us rooms at one end of the rambling two-story building that was then occupied as a legation. It stood at the corner of the Bund and the Creek, where the Grand Hotel now is, and belonged to a man named Hoey, H-O-E-Y, who took advantage of my inexperience and the love of books he had discovered to be one of my weaknesses to sell me an imperfect copy of the Penny, Encyc Penny Cyclopedia for more than a complete one would have cost at home. I used to play bowls sometimes with Albert Markham of Arctic fame, who was then a lieutenant on board HMS Centaur, and Charles Wergman, the artist correspondent of the Illustrated London News. Towards the end of October, 
we induced the colonel to consent to our getting two lessons a week from the Reverend S.R. Brown and to allow us to engage a native teacher in inverted commas at the public expense. So we had to get a second and pay for him out of our own pockets. He also agreed to leave us the mornings free for study up to one o'clock. A teacher, it must be understood, does not mean a man who can teach. In those days at Peking and in Japan also, we worked with natives who did not understand a word of English. And the process by which one made out the meaning of a sentence was closely akin to that which Poe describes in the gold beetle for the deciphering of a cryptograph. Through my boy, who was equally ignorant of English, I got hold of a man who explained that he had once been a doctor and having nothing to do at the moment would teach me Japanese without any pay. We used to communicate at first by writing down Chinese characters. One of his first sentences was literally, Prince loves men. I also venerate the prince as a master. Prince, as I afterwards divined, being merely a polite way of saying you. He said he had lots of dollars and ichibus and would take nothing for his services. So I agreed with him that he should come to my room every day from 10 to one. However, he never presented himself again after the first interview. Here is Sato in 1869, in Paris, and think, I think. And here he is in 1903, in London, on home leave. My boy turned out to be what I considered a great villain. I had, at an early date, wanted one of the native dictionaries of Chinese characters with the Japanese equivalents in katakana. I sent him out to buy one, but he shortly returned and said that there, was, there were none in the place and he must go over to Kanagawa where he would be sure to find uh, what I wanted. After being out the whole day, he brought me a copy, which he said was the only one to be found of which he charged me four Ichibus or nearly $2. This was just after my arrival when I was new to the place and ignorant of prices. Six weeks afterwards, being in the bookseller shop, I asked him what was the price of the book when he replied that he had asked only one and a half Ichibus. My boy had taken it away and returned next day to say that I had refused to give more than one, which he could consequently accept it. Unconscionable, unconscionable rascal this, not content with less than 300% of a squeeze. I found out also that he had kept back a large slice out of money I had paid to a carpenter for some chairs and a table. He had to refund his illicit gains or else to find another place. After a time, I got my rooms at the legation and was able to study to my heart's content. The lessons which Mr. Brown gave me were of the greatest value. Besides, hearing us repeat the sentences out of his book of colloquial Japanese and explaining the grammar, he also read with us part of the first sermon in the collection entitled Kyuo Dowa, so that I began to get some insight into the construction of the written language. Our two teachers were Takaoka Kaname, a physician from Wakayama in Kishu, and another man whose name I forget. He was stupid and of little assistance. Early in 1863, Robertson went home on sick leave and I had Takaoka Kaname to myself. In those days, the correspondence with the Japanese government was carried on by means of Dutch, the only European tongue of which anything was known. Uh, an absurd idea existed at one time that Dutch was the court language of Japan. Nothing was further from the farther from the truth. It was studied solely by a corps of interpreters attached to the Dutch settlement at Nagasaki. And when Kanagawa and Hakodate were open to foreign trade, some of these interpreters were transferred to, these, to those ports. On our side, we had collected with some difficulty a body of Dutch interpreters. They included three Englishmen, one Cape Dutchman, one Swiss, and one real Dutchman from Holland. And they received very good pay. Of course, it was my ambition to learn to read, write, and speak Japanese, and so to displace these middlemen. So Takaoka began to give me lessons in the epistolary style. He used to write a short letter in the running hand and after copying it out in square character, explained to me its meaning. Then I made a translation and put it away for a few days. Meanwhile, I exercised myself in reading, now one and now the other copy of the original. Afterwards, I took out my translation and tried to put it back into Japanese from memory. The plan is one recommended by Roger Ash Ascombe and by the late George Long in a preface to his edition of the De, Senec Senec De Senectute, etc., which had been one of my school books. Before long, I had got a thorough hold of a certain number of phrases, which I could piece together in the form of a letter, 
And this was all the easier as the epistolary style of that time demanded the employment of a vast collection of merely complimentary phrases. I also took writing lessons from an old writing master whom I engaged to come to me at fixed hours. He was afflicted with a watery eye and nothing but a firm resolve to learn would ever have enabled me to endure the constant drip from the diseased orbit, which fell now on the copybook, now on the paper I was writing on, as he led over, uh, to, over it to correct a bad stroke now on the table. There are innumerable styles of calligraphy in Japan, and at that date, the onye ryu was in fashion. I had unluckily taken up with the mercantile form of this. Several years afterwards, I changed to a teacher who wrote a very beautiful hand, but still it was onye ryu. After the revolution of 1868, the karayo, which is more picturesque and self-willed, became the mode, and I put myself under the tuition of Takasai Ten Tanzan, who was the leader of several the teacher of several nobles, and one of the half dozen best in Tokyo. But owing to this triple change of style, and also perhaps for want of real perseverance, I never came to have a good handwriting, nor to be able to write like a Japanese. Nor did I ever acquire the power of composing in Japanese without making mistakes, though I had almost daily practice for seven or eight years in the translation of official documents. Perhaps that kind of work is of itself not calculated to ensure correctness, as the translator's attention is more bent on giving a faithful rendering of the original than on writing good Japanese. I shall have more to stay, say at a later period as to the change which the Japanese written language has undergone in consequence of the imitation of European modes of expression. The first occasion on which my knowledge of the epistolary style was put into requisition was in, on, in June 1863, when there came a note from one of the shogun's ministers, the exact wording of which was a matter of importance. It was therefore translated three times, once from the Dutch by Eusden, by Seabolt, with the aid of his teacher from the original Japanese, and by myself. I shall never forget the sympathetic joy of my dear Willis when I produced mine. There was no one who could say which of the three was the most faithful rendering, but in his mind and my own, there was of course no doubt. I think I had sometime previously translated a private letter from a Japanese to one of our colleagues who had left Yokohama. It must have been done with great literalness, for I rec recollect that Sesha was rendered, I the shabby one, but it could not be made use of officially to testify to my progress in the language. After the Richardson affair, the tycoon's government erected guardhouses all along the Tokaido within treaty limits, and even proposed to divert the trains of the daimyos to another route which ran through the town of Atsugi, but this project fell through. Foreigners were in the habit of using it for their excursions, but Robertson and I had to pass along it twice a week on our way to and from our Japanese lesson at Mr. Brown's. And though determined not to show the white feather, I always felt in passing one of these trains that my life was in peril. On one occasion, as I was riding on the Tokaido for my pleasure, I met a tall fellow armed with the usual two swords who made a step towards me in what I thought was a threatening manner, and having no pistol with me, I was rather alarmed, but he passed on, content probably with having frightened a foreigner. That is the only instance I can recollect of even seeming intention on the part of a samurai to do me harm on a chance meeting in the street. And the general belief in the bloodthirsty character of that class, in my opinion, was to a very great extent without foundation. But it must be admitted that whenever a Japanese made up his mind to shed the blood of a foreigner, he took care to do his business pretty effectually. My first experience of an earthquake was on the 2nd of November of this year. It was said by the foreign residents to have been a rather severe one. The house shook considerably as if some very heavy person were walking in list slippers along the veranda and passages. It lasted several seconds, dying away gradually, and gave me a slight sensation of sickness, insomuch that I was beginning to fancy that a, sh a shaking which lasted so long must arise from within myself. I believe the sensations of most persons in ex on experiencing a slight shock of an earthquake for the first time are very similar. It is usually held that familiarity with these phenomena does not breed contempt for them, but on the contrary, persons who have resided longest in Japan are the most nervous about the danger. And there is a reason for this. We know that in not very recent times, extremely violent shocks have occurred, throwing down houses, splitting the earth and causing death to thousands of people in a few moments. <clears throat> 
The longer the interval that has elapsed since the last, the sooner may its reoccurrence be looked for. We have escaped many times, but the next will perhaps will be perhaps our last. So we feel on each occasion and the anticipation of harm becomes stronger and stronger. And where we at first used to sit calmly through a somewhat prolonged vibration, the wooden joints of the house harshly creaking and the crockery rattling merrily on the shelves, we now spring from our chairs and rush for the door at the slightest movement. My experiences in Japan of an exciting kind were pretty numerous, but I regret to say never included a really serious earthquake. And those who care to read more about the insignificant specimens that the country produces nowadays must be referred to the pages of the Seismological Society's journal and other publications of the distinguished geologist, my friend, Professor John Milne, who has not only recorded observations on a large number of natural earthquakes, but has even suggested in producing artificial ones so closely resembling the real thing as almost to defy detection. And that is the end of chapter five. So I will stop the video here. Thank you very much for listening.